I got my PhD in 1960, had a couple of babies, and then in, in 1963, I, uh, I was involved in a pilot approach to uh, agricultural and rural development. It was done in six villages about uh, the heads of Laguna. And so, in the beginning, you know, when you're in your PhD, you think you're better than anybody else, and you think you know more than anybody else. So when they were asking me to join them, I said, no, 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 I'm not interested. And of course, they can ask you two or three times after that. They don't ask you anymore. <laughs> so I said, the world is passing by, and I'm not in it. So I decided I want to I want to be a part of it. So I was in charge of the research and evaluation component of the project, and it was the it was uh, implemented by the Farm and Home Development Project at UPLB, and this had quite a bit of uh, Ford Foundation and Cornell component in it. So rice is something that I, I was really interested in. I don't know why. Perhaps it's because it's something that we eat every day. We can't do without. And it's something that you find in both rich and poor. And you, you can't ignore it. It's always there. No matter what happens, it's always there. If it's not there, you better find it. No? So that's my, and more than that, in agriculture, rice can be grown at that time, six months. Of course, now it's, uh, I think now it's about 120 days. So it's about four months or less. So, you know, you can easily see the, the product within that period. But most of all, it is a product of science that has reached the farthest corner of this country. There are not many products of science that have touched the common man as much as rice and I think vaccines. No? So this is, uh, this is terribly important to me. In the beginning, I wasn't sure that having an institute like this within the neighborhood of UPLB, which was so poor at that time, the contrast was so great. I remember very well I think it was a secretary of education who visited Erie and he looked, he looked and said, I cannot see the connection between the man who plants rice and eats rice and these fantastic buildings. Because at that time, this was just a standout compared to, to UPLB. At that time, the housing was terrible. Uh, at UPLB and all that. So, and then, of course, there were a lot of critics and people who said, if they had just given us the money, we can do it. Uh, that, that, was the, that was the thinking. And the thinking also was that uh, the Filipino rice scientists were not given, were not given as much uh, credit, you know. Well, um, I was a visiting professor at Cornell when the new rice varieties was released. Before that, I gave a seminar in the International Agricultural Development Program. And I was saying that farmers will not adapt 
these new varieties because they were Cadillac varieties compared to what farmers were using. And, you know, of course, Erie heard about it and some of them were upset, you know. Why is he saying that? Then I came home. And that was 1967. So, you know, that's when I got involved with Randy and all that. So then when I saw how farmers have responded, then that was how I produced, you know, All in a Grain of Rice, the book. And that book, people asked me, why wasn't it published by Eri? I said, I did not want Eri to publish it because at that time, you know, the Miracle Rice was very controversial. And if I say positive things about it, they would think it's because Eri paid for the book. And I want to maintain the independence of the book. And at the time when the controversy was raging, you would have journalists, you would have economists, what have you, coming to Eri. But Eri didn't know. After they visited Eri, they will go to me to ask me, find out what I have to say. Am I saying the same thing that the Erie scientist said? No? So that was, um, uh, that was the time when I had written, I had written the book. And as I mentioned uh, once, uh, the grant to write that book was $3,000, believe it or not, during that time. And it was given by Ford Foundation. And Ford Foundation said, well, if she's going to write about uh, Erie, Erie varieties, why shouldn't Erie pay for it? And I said, no, I don't want Erie to pay for it. And so, but then they said, we've got to get some contribution from Erie. So that was when Randy said, we'll set aside $3,000 for you to travel to the other international centers, no? So it will not be for the book, but for that. But I never spent that money because then our project needed more money. And I said to Randy, why don't you use that money, you know, to cover our, our uh, uh, further needs? So that's how it, uh, that's how it came out. So I spent, I think, 18 months, you know, uh, writing this, writing this book. And it was not difficult to do because all my graduate students and everybody else in campus in Dilwan, they were all writing about the impact of the Green Revolution. So it was easy to put things together. Uh, so that was, uh, that was it. And then, uh, I think it was when they needed very much someone who would develop the gender, the women in rice farming systems program. Uh, Tina David was the head of socioeconomics and said, Elio, why don't you, you know, spend some time with us. Then Swaminathan talked me into it. It's hard to say no when Swaminathan, you know. Uh, so I did. I developed the, you know, the framework and traveled a great deal to these different countries to find out what the prospects are. And, uh, and uh, I developed the, uh, the program and now we are going to how we are going to proceed. Then, uh, during the time of Lampe, I knew Lampe before he came to Iri. So, he would invite me to come over to the, if he has some things that are bothering him or what, he would call me and we will talk about it. Uh, because uh, 
uh, he knows I will say it straight. I may be, I may be wrong, but I'll be always be honest. No? So we, we we could, you know, exchange views very very frankly. And so he said, "Why don't you, you know, really spend time here?" Uh, because he found out I was about to retire. And I said, you don't have to pay me to get my input. And then he looked at me and said, are you rich? <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. OK, then it's all settled, he said. But I said, I have a commitment. Even before I retired, I already had a commitment to go to Stockholm for about uh, three months or so to evaluate their program on the international, of the International Foundation for Science. So I said, I have to wait a year, you know, before I could join you. But uh, I said, any time, you know, uh, you, can, you can call me. So that started, uh, that started it. So a year after my retirement, I came here. I think in terms of uh, the, the scientific and, uh, and research uh, experience, EU ranks at the top. <clears throat> now that's partially a consequence of my being here at EU as, as a scientist and researcher. There's nothing more exciting than being a scientist and researcher. I mean, it's like play, playing roulette and you get paid for it. You know, it's incredible that you go out there and you place your bet, you put your plots in, you have your hypothesis, and you find out that it works, damn it. It's, this is so exciting. I mean, I remember when we had the typhoon Didang and there was so much flooding that the Ministry of Agriculture tried to develop, a, asked us to develop a, um, a technique for growing a 70-day rice crop because so much of the season had uh, had been lost and by double transplanting and so on we managed to do this it was it was basically placing a bet that this would work we'd done some research on it before we'd never really put it all together we couldn't test it anymore because there was no time for it we had to just go with it and it worked uh, and it, it gave them at least uh, about an 80 percent of the yields that they used to have so the excitement of conducting research uh, is, is, is not enough talked about. Scientists have pretty dour, uh, you know, and, but, uh, but it is a very, very exciting existence. So that's a highlight. And the, as I mentioned, the other highlight, the best job in the system, in my opinion, is that of research, or director of research. It's tough on people, uh, and it's tough on the people's side. You've got to interact and and, and deal with, uh, with an incredible amount of, of interpersonal problems among scientists and between the, the direction and scientists and so on. So that, that's a very tough part. And, uh, but I think it is, it is an extremely rewarding position. I think back to my dad's last years uh, he died October 20th, 1988, just shy of his 88th birthday. Yeah. And he continued to be interested, you know, very much interested in what was going on at the centers. And I hear a lot of discussion going on now about what are the future challenges oh, to yeah. the centers. Oh, and yeah. he, had, he had three things that he saw as long-term concerns. The first was uh, where would they get the right kind of director generals and who were they? Uh, initially, of course, the first several were Americans. Most of them have been at least Western trained. In some of his conversations with the staff, uh, Asian, American, and every other nationality, there was a feeling that 
at least the next director general at the time he was part of the selection process probably should be another Westerner. But he envisioned the need for the right kind of men or women to head up a growing number of institutes and he was concerned about where they were going to come from. The second thing he was concerned about was political pressure. He, he saw a couple of institutes being created in areas and in subject matters where he felt the return on the investment would be very low and that they were created because that part of the geographic region said we've got to have one and that they would not stay focused. And the third was the lack of the how do you keep the kind of focus you had when you had one of each kind and a director general out in the field as you grew bigger and became more spread out more thinly and became more bureaucratic. He had a lifetime horror of bureaucracy and what it could do to stop progress. This is uh, when he was made a fellow of the American Farm Economics Association in 1966. This is the last paragraph. Professor Hill was best known among graduate students for his colorful metaphors his ability to anticipate questions and even to formulate an answer almost before a question was completed. <laughs> he is best at his best in informal discussions. Talking with Frosty Hill as a stimulating to colleagues as to graduate students because of his quick mind, enthusiasm, and sense of humor. He combines an unusually an unusual degree of keen analytical mind with the colloquial expressions, common sense, and pragmatism characteristic of the American frontier. In 98, as I was becoming familiar with, with Rice, uh, it was obvious that Rice is, uh, is, is clearly a public sector activity. Now, that does not take into account clearly all of the equipment and uh, processing that, that was done by the private sector. In terms of developing technologies, uh, clearly the private sector was involved in that. But in terms of the germplasm and primarily the agronomic research that would have been associated with, with germplasm, uh, there was not a lot of private sector involvement. I'm not going to say there was none, but if you looked at where most of the technologies came from, they would have come from the public sector. My concern for Rice in this area is that with the decline in funding from the public sector, if you looked at other commodities, maize for example, as public sector funding went down, private sector funding went up. Such that if you looked at, at, at the, the, cons the, the, the producer, he wasn't being shortchanged in terms of product. In other words, when I started to, to, to school in the 60s, all of the major Midwestern universities had a corn breeding program. Now maybe two of them do, maybe three. But yet the farmers still have a wide array of germplasm products coming out every year, new ones from the private sector. Now, do, are we gonna have that in rice? In other words, as public sector funding goes down, 
is the public sector going to step forward? And that's a real issue. Now, one of the things that has intrigued me about hybrids is I thought this would be a way for the private sector to get involved in, in rice. So there, there are a lot of issues surrounding hybrid rice. In other words, I mean, there are problems that you have in rice that you don't have in, in sorghum and maize and, and other hybrid products in terms of the heterosis, in terms of the, 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 the production systems, the, the, ster the sterility systems and stuff are, are more complicated in, than, 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 for example, maize. Um, I think it would be great if hybrids were successful because this is clearly something that will draw in public sector, I mean private sector support. And all of a sudden you will start having products, research and products being done by the private sector on rice germplasm. The hybrid rice program was uh, being explored at the exploratory stage between 1980 to 82. It was, uh, I vividly recall the experience that uh, during the board of trustees meeting, the chairman of the board would come normally about uh, a couple of days before, like on Friday, and spend the weekend here when the board meeting starts on Monday. And I remember Dr. Clarence Gray was the chairman in 1981. And on Saturday morning, he had this uh, routine of taking a ride at Erie Farm, looking at what is going on. And there were many scientists used to work even on Saturdays in the field. And that was the season in April 1981, I think that was the time that I was trying to convince myself and also present the experimental evidence whether hybrid rice would be a practical option for the tropical rice farmers. And I was looking at my trial and about maybe around 11 o'clock in the morning and he passed by and he stopped. I saw me in the field and he did know at the time Dr. Nile Brady was the, uh, the, the director and he didn't know that Erie was trying to explore about hybrid rice and everybody was asking Erie about hybrid rice. So he stopped and I showed him the, the trial and showed him certain hybrids that were just experimental hybrids and uh, compared to the high yielding varieties like IR36, IR42 and so on. And when he saw it that uh, time when he was really convinced that yes, there is something to it and then he had a lunch with Nile Brady uh, after that visit and during that he mentioned that I saw this hybrid program in Erie and it looks like there is some promise and then the following week after the board meeting was over then Nile uh, kind of organized a GU scientist uh, meeting and visit to that experimental plot. And I think that was a kind of turning point when the management as well as the board of trustees got convinced that yes, this is something serious that we should make a commitment. And that's one example of how, how things uh, were kind of came into being and then brought the, the, the commitment to hybridized work at Erie. One of the things that sort of inspired me when I got to my, when I left Erie, came back to Charleston, South Carolina, is that finding out that Charleston, South Carolina is where rice first came into the United States and uh, the major rice variety there that made the huge plantations and huge fortunes along the coast, coastal areas of South Carolina was a variety called Carolina Gold. And so realizing the importance of rice and into the history and the so many threads associated with the history, the slavery, so on and so forth. I got interested in Carolina Gold and we started a Carolina Gold Rice Foundation. And uh, 
I'm the vice president and chairman of the board of that foundation. And this past August, which was 2005, we had a major symposium, which Tom Hargrove and Gerda F. Cush and many of the people that we know in the rice world made uh, made presentations. Uh, but it also included more than just scientific presentations on rice. It included rice, rice architecture, rice culture, rice history, uh, and so forth. And so it was a major symposium, and the proceedings will be coming out soon uh, for the for that uh, foundation, foundation uh, those foundation presentations. Uh, that's this one of the spin-offs that comes when you when you uh, work in a culture where rice is so important and you're looking for some way to do it. Currently, I'm uh, still working with rice, uh, although our laboratory is a vegetable uh, laboratory. Uh, we also, under the Clemson part, we 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 uh, share a laboratory with the Department of Agriculture, a brand new thirty million dollar facility. It's it's a really very nice facility. But we also cover what we call specialty crops, and under that specialty crops umbrella, I still work with rice. And Gerd have uh, crossbred some, uh, bred some uh, Carolina Gold rice with some of his high yielding varieties. We kept the gold trait in uh, short stature and higher yielding, since Carolina Gold has a tendency to lodge, uh, that is fall down in the presence of heavy rains and, and wind. And now we've been screening for this is our eighth year, and we have one that we think is going to be a real winner. We're going to call it Charleston Gold, as a as a, a progeny or partly progeny of, of, of the Carolina Gold thing. So, I'm real real happy about that. Uh, we'll see how that goes within the next uh, couple of years. If it does have some really good traits and good taste characteristics, and it will be released as a variety. Of course, if it doesn't, we won't release it. I'll be learning by doing because obviously a consortium board to make decisions on the technicalities for example of programs of 16 centres working in different continents on different subjects is totally beyond them so the role of existing boards the role of host country agreements and all those things have still got to be resolved I don't think those issues of governance have been looked at some of which have major implications for example I mean clearly uh, Erie will continue to need the inputs that it can get from a technical point of view of its board with a, a good spread of people who have skills in those areas probably won't need to worry so much about if you like the sort of um, uh, the basic accounting and all those kind of things because supposedly now there is a sort of centralized legal system with presumably checks and balances uh, for monitoring that so some of the headaches you know this whole business of getting every step I mean everything the amount of paperwork came back to CG you know to the CG secretariat for all sorts of reasons statistics on numbers of women scientists and all that a lot of that will go now so that they're not saying those things aren't important but you know there will be greater priorities on actually getting delivery of outcomes which is what donors want rather than a whole lot of statistics that nobody ever uses and which have frustrated DGs and others for quite some time. So um, I think there will be a lot of learning by doing because this is a change and as I say donors in particular can be perverse in terms of the way they change. Not least if there's a recession back home and they suddenly decide to cut their support. And research is usually seen as the soft touch then there are problems. I mean, the UK, for example, fortunately, has decided of all of its programs, although it's got to have a 25% cut across all government departments, international development has been ring fenced and won't be touched, which in a way is good news for the CGR, even though there will probably be some internal adjustments as to what goes for research, what goes for development, what goes to health, as opposed to agriculture, what goes to water. Uh, what is cross cross cutting? So there's some so there, there's some dialogues there, but I mean I think it's uh, I would imagine that in the long run it will provide greater stability. You won't have 64 donors all doing their own thing. It's just to some extent what happened before, and for centres having to go and 
you know, go and uh, genuflect in front of donors in order to get support and, and be competing against their fellow DGs and others in what is not always a collegial way. To us, it was incredible. It was just, you know, Erie was a magical playground. And I think uh, your perspective of Erie as a child depended on what age you were, because when you were, you know, five, six, seven, it was just huge. And you just ran free and wild. You, out of the house, who's out playing, who can come out and play in and out of each other's houses and, and all that. And as you got a little older, um, you know, 10, 11, 12, incredible games at night. We'd all come out at night, you know, seven o'clock at night after dinner to play soccer at the tennis court or volleyball or kick the can or, you know, it was just great camaraderie between the kids and, and everyone was out and crawling. And then as you reached your upper teenage years where, you know, you were too cool to play all those little games and stuff, there was just moments of just incredible boredom <laughs> sitting on the top of the steps looking down to the tennis courts where all your friends at IS and Manila were all visiting each other over the weekend and the group of you were stuck here in the compound without much to do and you know such incredible boredom you'd be convinced Tinky Navasar and I are still convinced we saw a UFO in the sky one night and you know we'd sit there praying that somebody's parents would get a shipment from Denmark so we could have some real potato chips and you know just but those times too built some of the greatest bonds and the greatest memories we were all already just so close and so tight all the kids like a big group big family big group of siblings and and everything my dad wasn't the talker at home but uh, it was usually my mom talking about animals of some sort and if the subject wasn't about animals she'd find a way to direct it to animals but no my dad didn't talk a lot about it and um, we knew his title sounded important agricultural economist but invariably the next question was well what's he doing we, I have absolutely no idea <laughs> you know we just had no idea and to the point where there were friends of mine in Manila that were seriously concerned because um, you know we lived out in this remote area they weren't even sure we had electricity out there you know and um, you know they'd ask about my dad and you know he's gone for many months out of the year and you know we can't really pinpoint exactly where he is at any given time but you know we get a postcard once in a while you know and um, some friends expressed a real concern that they thought he was really, you know, part of the CIA and we were in some sort of witness protection program or something, you know, <laughs> they just, we had no idea what he did, we really didn't. We had uh, a lot of little children growing up. My son was the first to be born of Erie staff in July of 62. But after that, there were quite a few being born and also more staff was coming with young children. So we had a lot of traffic of, of children and nannies and maids on the road going up to the swimming pool and going to, to school and going to the playground and just, just going across the street to play with each other. And the director and his wife were real fast drivers. They would come zooming down that hill. And so we young mothers at the bottom of the hill decided that this was a dangerous thing to do. So I initiated a petition and I got all of my young mothers to sign this petition and I gave it to Bob. And because of that, we had those speed bumps. Those are my speed bumps. Oh, is that right? <laughs> And it was really directed at Bob and Sonny because they were the ones that, that, you know, they're busy and they're just zooming down the road or zooming up the road. And that slowed people down. And I was famous for that. <laughs> Probably the earliest um, moment for me to sort of understand uh, in greater context of what he, he was doing is that um, at IS we had a lot of uh, IS would annually send field trips of kids to I, uh, to Erie because Erie was such a uh, gem 
uh, in terms of a, a, of a place, an institution where uh, they're doing something important. And I remember, I think I was in fifth or sixth grade at the time, and uh, we took a field trip to Erie, and um, uh, they were brought to the auditorium, and they were given um, a film to, to see of Erie, and then my father spoke, and I think that was at, at that point I really sort of it was sort of a defining moment, an epiphany for me that uh, that my father was really something uh, special and uh, doing some really good work because uh, it wasn't until I saw the film and uh, put it in the context of what was going on at Erie and going on a tour that I finally figured out because for us while we were growing up, Erie was more of a place where we would ride our bicycles around all day in the fields. <laughs> uh, and uh, we would just uh, stop by the uh, canteen for donuts uh, uh, and then maybe stop by our dad's office and say hi. And, and then we were off again to ride our bicycles all day long. Now that I have a greater appreciation of uh, the impact of his work, uh, I think that uh, uh, he... You know, he struck me as someone who was um, very uh, low-key, uh, very um, humble, and um, didn't really want to boast about his work a lot. And uh, he, uh, I think, went about his work very quietly uh, in many ways because uh, he was uh, doing uh, a lot of things sort of behind the scenes. Uh, but. We knew that, um, uh, I, I, in retrospect, I should have realized this because we, we uh, had uh, visiting Erie, an uh, entire cast of uh, scientific all-stars, if you could put it. Uh, some of the best uh, agricultural research scientists would uh, make uh, a pilgrimage to Erie to visit and uh, view and uh, review the work here and uh, we would always have a chance to meet them because um, these uh, scientists would come to our home and they would sit with my father on the porch and, uh, and a lot of times we would sit right next to him while he was having a scientific discussion with, uh, it could be Norman Borlaug, it could be um, Sir Otto Frankel or Sir Ralph Riley. Uh, all these luminaries uh, would come by and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I should have realized that, uh, you know, there's a good reason why all these uh, famous scientists are coming by to visit Erie all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I, for me, as I grow older, I, I find that I'm getting more philosophical and that's what I'm starting to really appreciate, you know, what my father and all the other fathers uh, accomplished, you know, because you get more of a world view on things and uh, know what the ramifications are for the world's population. So, um, you know, and, and that's how I really appreciate it. But growing up, you know, we probably didn't get a full feel for how important the work was because a lot of scientists uh, went through their, about their work very quietly and modestly. And it was actually, for me, more you know, I got a sense of the importance of their work more through some of my classmates and their parents. These classmates, uh, their parents would work for the Asian Development Bank or World Health Organization. And when, when they found out that your parents were working for Erie, well, they said, oh, Erie, okay, we'd like, we'd like to come visit and, you know, talk to your parents or come for a visit. So for me, it was more coming from an external stimulus. Yeah, Erie, uh, you know, amongst the uh, the students at uh, IS uh, was considered a sort of a, a intellectual powerhouse. Uh, uh, all these very highly motivated and well-educated uh, parents, um, you know, uh, I think that our relative isolation here uh, compared to the city also uh, uh, lent itself to less exposure to some of the materialistic aspects of living in a big city. And so uh, I think that uh, uh, we had a lot of that benefit from not having been exposed to a lot of the urban problems that uh, some of our counterparts at IS 
had to grow up living in uh, Makati at that time. What was the driving time in those days to the American school where I is? It was about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes uh, back then. Um, but initially, um, we didn't even have the expressway. We used to take the old highway to uh, Manila uh, and uh, we would go through Muntinlupa and we'd have to go through these. Uh, we basically drove on uh, two, a two-lane road, one way each way. And, um, but back then, even then, uh, traffic was not that bad. We could make it to Manila, uh, to IS, in an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, clearly, um, the expressway improved it, but then I think the, traf the volume of traffic arose to meet the, uh, the capacity of the expressway. I believe that our work to identify a, a methodology that could be followed by national programs and by many others around the world to, have, to look at and understand how core pieces of technology in the farming system interrelated one with another and how it complemented other farm activities. It's a little bit different than looking at whole farm farming systems. There are many programs like that, but we always took rice technology as the core piece of, of technology that we wanted to understand. I believe the contribution of that, there were a couple of things that were very striking in the early days. One of them was that we discovered and were able eventually to uh, persuade our colleagues throughout the Institute that uh, not always did rice technology considered alone uh, turn out to be the best approach. That was we were able to show that many times eerie technology as developed on the farm uh, might not be successful on farms because of the many other conditions that impinged on rice farming. For example, the, the real uh, value of an early rice variety, 1529, which was an early maturing rice variety uh, that was followed then later by IR36, uh, was not that it was higher yielding globally as a high yielding rice, but the fact that it matured early. So there was a sacrifice of yield for timeliness and that made rice fit much better into an entire farming system and enabled other crops to be grown in other seasons. Uh, Dr. Brady did recruit uh, what we would have to call uh, the Young Turks of the Institute of the time. We thought we were a relatively large multinational community of young scientists who uh, you know, didn't expect to stay at Erie forever. We, we, in fact, I think most of us thought that we were coming there for maybe two years, five years at the most. We most persisted for at least ten years. And uh, that particular generation uh, happened to have worked at Erie during a period when funding was, uh, was on the rise. So there was a tremendous esprit de corps, a tremendous uh, spirit of accomplishment. Uh, the flip side of it is that we were full of ourselves and were often up to tricks. Uh, there was uh, hardly a week passed that some uh, gimmick or some trick, some uh, mischievous act didn't take place on the compound of uh, the young scientists uh, uh, playing tricks on one another. Like, for example, walling up the doors to one's house with uh, river stones so that they couldn't leave their house the next morning. Removing scaffolding from a building project to scaffold in another home overnight. Uh, sometimes uh, names to the houses were, uh, at first the uh, posts that, were, uh, that had the names of persons' houses were just stuck into the ground. Well, that was too easy to move. So those, every morning, people would wake up to find they were living in the wrong house or, or they had the wrong name in front of their house. Um, then they started setting them in the concrete. Uh, and, but even those sometimes got somehow out of the ground and one ended up in the swimming pool. Uh, so there were, oh, there were antics galore among those scientists, but I would still, it was probably the, uh, one of the very best working environments one would ever want to be in, in terms of collegiality, uh, wherewithal to do research, uh, support for our research was tremendous.
Another person that contributed a lot to Erie uh, and who I just saw last week was Quanchat Gomez. I give her a lot of credit for the rigor and quality of research that came out of Erie in those days. Um, she helped us uh, design the rather sophisticated replicated yield trials that we use to evaluate the products of this, you know, of this enhanced systematic breeding program. And uh, that again was modeled after, uh, somewhat after Simit, but rice is a much, you know, a more challenging uh, crop to, uh, to test in yield trials. And she designed a very sensitive, uh, uh, what we call a quadruple lattice uh, uh, design that really did a good job of differentiating among genotypes. And then she helped us a lot with the management of the data for the International Rice Testing Program. Um, you know, designed the appropriate uh, analyses that allowed us to get results out in a hurry. I remember I had an arrangement with her. She had one of the first portable computers. It was a Wang system. Wang, the Americans would say, but you know, uh, it was a Wang system, uh, which you know was pretty big for a portable computer. You could, but at least you could roll it around the room, and uh, <laughs> in in those days, and I really you know admired that machine. I remember that was in the early '70s or maybe mid '70s, and uh, so she she could turn out an analysis, you know, in in just a matter of minutes, which uh, you know. Uh, was you have to remember those were the days when you know we were just graduating from these mechanical uh, 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 you know uh, uh, Marchand and Monroe uh, adding machines basically they could also do the four functions but you know we'd done as a graduate student I'd done statistical analyses on those and you know an analysis of the variance could take all day running the sums of the squares and everything and so, being, you know, I was so impressed with that, and and you know, so people would send in their data, and then Bing, you know, we would send back the results, and uh, they were so impressed that that's what allowed that testing program to grow so rapidly and get so many enthusiastic uh, uh, cooperators. So I give her uh, a lot of a lot of credit. I would even say that you know the detection of IR thirty six, which was one of the most successful varieties of the era when I worked, uh, which was a team effort in the selection, but I think we would have never seen it in, if it hadn't been for the yield trials that she designed, because it was not an attractive variety. It was a very open habit early, and the birds would get on it fast, and you know, so it wasn't easy to just spot it with your eye. I have very high regard for uh, Kuban Chai Gomez as a statistician and scientist. But uh, frankly, there was absolutely no use of that design in selecting a year 36. We knew, I knew what plant type uh, I was looking for. I knew the height, I knew the plant architecture and the growth duration. So it was, uh, uh, it was just my visual observation, the keen eye for what I was looking for. Uh, the statistical design absolutely no uh, played no part in that. During one of the most critical days at Erie of my during my time, uh, and actually during a board meeting, um, Anna Marie was sending me a little note. Uh, she she was not. Uh, aware that the, the board meeting was still going on, so that that note was brought in the meeting, and it quoted Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, and she she uh, told her, her husband once also in a written note, um, "Do what you think is right." Uh, do it against all odds, uh, because you will be blamed anyway, and you will be right as long as you feel good in your heart. Uh, 
that, that, was, that was helpful in that moment, I can tell you. And uh, it, it was about half a year ago when, when I, uh, I was reading uh, a book uh, with uh, ideas of Lao Tse. As you know, uh, he lived 2,500 years ago. And, uh, and I don't know if Mrs. Roosevelt uh, ever was reading Lao Tse, but uh, he said at that time already almost the same thing. And uh, in, in, plain, in, in plain English language, uh, it, it says, uh, decide carefully what you do. Do it and leave the place. That is the best avenue towards inner peace. Um, and when I read it, I said, yes, uh, you and Eleanor are right. And I have, my, I have found the avenue towards inner peace and I'm, I'm almost there. I guess the, the most interesting part of being in the Philippines and being a part of Erie was meeting the people. The people that were from all over the world, from different countries. Um, it made it a very enrich, enriching experience, uh, all the different cultures coming together. And I think that's what I enjoyed most about being at Erie. Um, being the wife of a busy uh, director general, um, we women found things to do when the men were busy being there, doing what they did. Uh, it was fun to get together and have potlucks and the food from all the different countries. It was, I've never had a potluck like that any play, any other place, but in, at Erie, all the different foods from the different uh, countries and cultures and uh, playing bridge with everybody and uh, the book club. I enjoyed the book club that we had very much. That was, uh, I lo love to read, but um, I wrote, read mostly uh, American authors and uh, uh, some of the ladies from other countries introduced me to other authors from other countries and it really made me uh, learn or I learned more and helped me understand more about um, other countries and, and their way of, of life. And um, it was a wonderful adventure. Uh, one that I wouldn't take for, you know, it was just uh, an amazing period in, in my life to be able to experience uh, uh, being in a, another, like in another world. And uh, I think it um, made me appreciate um, things more, things that I had taken for granted. Um, I, I learned to appreciate them more. Uh, also, my family, that was the hard part of being in the Philippines and being at Erie was being away from, from my family, my parents, and my children for those, those many years. However, the first year we were in the Philippines, I think I came back to the U.S. six times, and for one reason or another. And uh, I was saying, talking to my daughter on one of my visits, latter at the end of the year, and I said, Jennifer, I'm really sorry that I live so far away and I don't get to see you so often. She said, Mom, I've seen you more this year than I saw you the whole time you were in Iowa. And uh, that was true. And um, I did. I, I came back to visit children um, more than once a year. And, and also, we, our children visited us in the Philippines, and that was, they enjoyed that very much. Getting to see where, where we lived and how we lived and getting to meet some of the people that uh, we had grown very fond of the time that we were there in Erie.
Well, I'll tell you one story uh, th that relates to not the scientists, but to the Filipino staff uh, at the Institute. The CGIAR, Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, held a meeting in Manila. Their annual, one of their annual meetings was held in Manila. And uh, they decided to visit Erie on Sunday. And on Sunday, on Mount Makiling, up where they had beautiful grounds were, uh, they, I went up uh, with uh, my friends to check to see how they, if everything was all prepared for the dinner, for the luncheon, for this group to come. And I said to one of the young ladies who was uh, uh, helping with the service, uh, well, I said, uh, do you think it's first class? Oh, sir, she says, it's better than that. It's eerie class, which told me that she had pride in what Erie was doing. She had pride of being associated with the institution, which I thought was great.